So I've been around horses all my life. I guess I had horses. Um, probably started riding on my own when I was about six because from grade one to grade three I had my own horses and I was riding around by myself with no, you know, going off and riding wherever I wanted there uh, back in Canada in British Columbia where I live. And uh, played with horses and was around horses and we had a ranch, a cattle ranch. I lived on the cattle ranch and we always had a couple of horses around for me to ride and play with. We lived right next to a big river valley so I could go ride down in the river valley. Uh, every chance we got, I'd go with a neighbor kid and we'd disappear for the day and, and be off in the wilderness spending the whole day riding down there and then during high school and my teenage years I started starting horses for people they'd bring me horses to start I didn't know what I was doing at all but I rode horses and and people would pay me to ride their horses and train their horses and I seriously did not know what I was doing just because you know I'd rode horses but I did not know what I was doing I now now knowing what I know I realize how how little I did know and uh Anyways, that they would pay me to ride their horses, and and because I could ride them, they thought that was good, I guess. Um, so I did that for till 17, and then I started uh, working in for big game outfitters. So in Canada, we have a lot of big game outfits, and what that means is they uh, a lot of hunters from Europe and the United States would come to Canada, and we'd take them back into the mountains. Uh, and in this particular area, hunting area, was. Um, 80 miles as a crow flies so on a straight line from the nearest road so we'd fly back into there and the horses are all raised there the horses run loose in the mountains still to this day the horses are are born and bred there in the mountains no fences no pastures they're just loose up there and every every summer we have to go round the horses up we use the horses for a maximum of three months of the year and then the other nine months of the year they're just living in the wild and then we got to go find them again at the end of July, bring them in and we use them for those two to three months, kick them out again. Finding them again, well, finding these horses, uh, what that means is they're, they're turned loose. So uh, if you can imagine here in the Alps, we got in the Alps in Austria and there's bush and mountains and valleys and streams and rivers, the horses just are turned loose. And there's no pastures, no fences, no roads for 40 miles in any direction, 100 miles in, in any direction. There's no, there's no roads, no fences, none. And the horses are just turned loose. They can go anywhere they want. You have to go find them in July. And you first, the first horses you have to walk on foot and you take your halter with you and you walk out there and you go find a horse and you find one that you can catch. And then you'll bring that one and you'll start riding him and see if you can chase a couple other horses in, you know, and get them into the corrals at, at our at our lodge, at our camp. Bring the horses into there and then you can slowly pick different horse every day to go out and, and look for the other ones and bring them in. And it usually takes at least 12 days uh, uh, to round up. And there's about usually around 250 head of horses there. So it takes about 12 days to round those horses up and you usually lose couple pounds a day so in 12 days you're you're 20 20 pounds lighter uh, my great uncle was who i was went to work for and he's he's the a true mountain man and um just the way he run things and operated things one of his one of the things that he one of the stories was he told us when I first got in there, when I was 17 years old, I'd never been to the mountains before. I never knew the country at all. Never been, never knew that that we had to go round the horses up or anything. But once I got there, that was part of my job. And so he said, uh, "Go find some horses and and bring them in." And and he and the rule was, you cannot come back to camp where where supper is and where food, you know, where where you're going to eat and sleep. You weren't allowed to come back to camp unless you had found horses and you brought them in. So if you went out there and found some and lost them, then they run off on you because they run off. They don't They don't just come trotting into the king. They take off in every different direction. And um, so you've got to work hard to get around them and then they go up here and you cut them off and then they go over there and you cut them off and you're miles in every different direction trying to get these horses and finally you get them into, if you work hard enough at it and try hard enough at it, you'll finally get the horses in, then you can come to camp. But if you don't do that, you don't get to come back. The mountain deal that I'm talking about, we call it high and wild, and so we get people from all over the world come to come to the Canada, and they they fly into British Columbia, and then and then 
they meet with me and we take them into the mountains and it's a learning holiday adventure so i do the learning holiday adventure uh, adventure in the mountains in british columbia i do another one in costa rica and i do another one in brazil so both of those are in in what we, you know november and january that we do those trips but they're they're a holiday a learning holiday adventure just like they sound there's adventure there's holiday and uh, there's learning and they're all different everyone's different the mountain thing you're you're like I said, 80 miles from the nearest road. The uh, Costa Rican adventure, you're in swimming pools and, and in the ocean. And in um, uh, Brazil, you're staying at a big fancy ranch and riding Lusitano horses. So each place, is the, the animals are different, the, the setup's different, but still a learning holiday adventure. At my home, uh, I call it the horse ranch. And the horse ranch uh, is in British Columbia as well, and near Fort St. John, British Columbia. And uh, our, my website's thehorseranch.com. Um, so there, people also come from all over the world. So, and every any given year, we might have six different countries will fly to Canada to my ranch, which is separate from the mountains. So the, there's the mountain trip, high and wild. Then there's the horse ranch, which is where I live, and people will come there, and they can they can spend from four days to two years people will come and stay on the ranch and and work on their horsemanship so my whole my whole point of being around horses is to learn more horsemanship for myself and to try to teach other people what i've learned so far so the ranch they can come and stay at the horse ranch at my place they can uh, stay at the, at the uh, ranch and they can um, camp there they can they can rent a room and the people from overseas that come from you know, um, Austria and Switzerland and Australia and Mexico, the people that come from all over the place, obviously they don't have a horse, so we lease them horses and they, they use horses. And then they're pe all people that are interested in following the stages, my stages program. So there's stage one, stage two, stage three, and it goes on up the ladder. And um, so they come and, and they're interested in learning the program and and then that is why I end up going to the other countries as well too because the whether it's Brazil or Costa Rica that's why I'm there is to help the people there come to them so that they can start working on a stage program to develop their horsemanship skills. A lot of times people say um, that there's a difference between Western and English riding, and I would agree. There is a difference between Western and English riding, but there isn't a difference between the horsemanship. Horsemanship is horsemanship because it involves horses and humans, man and horses. So uh, when it comes to horsemanship, which is what I'm interested in and will always be interested in, it doesn't matter what kind of saddle is on the horse, it doesn't matter what kind of clothes you wear, it doesn't matter what kind of hat you have on your head, Horsemanship is still horsemanship because you're dealing with horses and uh, and with humans. And so uh, the more I know and the more skills that I have, the better my horse will be. My horse is an absolute mirror of what I know. So you can buy a horse, let's say, that has some problems or whatever, but, but he can't have those problems forever. Or that means that you didn't know any more than the last guy that owned them. You're not doing any better than the last guy. So you, you can't blame the last guy forever. If your horsemanship skills are high enough, you will fix the problem with that horse. You'll change the problem because of your skills, you'll be able to fix that. And, and so horsemanship, and then the higher your skills are in horsemanship, the more problems aren't problems. They, they disappear. So, um, you know, people run into lots of things, trailer loading problems or... Uh, spooking problems or pulls back or can't trailer load or all these are very simple very simple things to fix but it all it, it is all determined by what we know and understanding the horses the more we understand horses we know what the horse needs and we know what we need to do to be able to help him and so then all those problems disappear um, when we're in Brazil we're, we're riding all English it's all English riding when I'm in Brazil I still wear my cowboy hat but I'm in an English saddle. Uh, we're working on uh, the original reason they got me there was to help them with the working equitation. They wanted me to come over and help work with their trainers and work with their horses. And and uh, at that time, there was a big belief that they had their, English, their dressage horses and they had their working equitation horses and that the dressage horses couldn't do the working equitation. And I didn't know that they had that 
thought in their head because it was not in my head if if you can ride him he can do work on equitation it's, it's not he doesn't have to be just one or the other so I had myself and I had some students that that met me over there and we just took all the horses and all the horses the dressage horses the jumping horses everybody did work in equitation and um, of course some did better at it than others but but by the end of it they were all doing the work in equitation and doing a great job um, and then when I go to uh, the mountains then we're all riding western horse you know western gear western saddles and stuff but nevertheless we're still the horse has to be willing and soft and you know the goal is that the horse understands what we're doing that we can get our horses respectful and we can build his confidence the people have to be understand how to respect the horse there's lots of ways to disrespect the horse accidentally so um, we're trying to figure out you know, having hands that close quickly, that's disrespecting of a horse. He, you might not you know, realize that. You don't even realize your hands did close quickly. People love to pull on horses. That's disrespectful to a horse. So we're born with all these traits, and we're all of us. No matter where I go in the world, no matter who comes to me from anywhere in the world, we all got these same things. We like to think we're great individuals, and I guess we are individuals in some ways, but there's certain things that we're all born with that get in the way of good horsemanship. <clears throat> So a good program, this is what, what, what I'm trying to teach and what I'm continually trying to get better at myself is to get rid of these non-serving traits that would hold me back and, and it holds my horsemanship back and it holds me back from helping a lot of horses and really developing horses. I believe that most horses, <clears throat> most people are getting maybe 5% to 10% of what their horse is capable of. Five to ten percent, so they're missing ninety to ninety-five percent everywhere I go. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable how much we're leaving on the table. Like the, the horses are so talented, there's so much. Even the the most unathletic, worst horse you could ever buy. There's so much stuff that you have not even touched on that horse. It's incredible. The, the more we know, the more we will bring out. There's a good horse around every tree if you know enough. So I've been told, I actually didn't realize this because I guess because because of what I do, nobody says it to me, maybe. Um, but I've been told that, that people say, and I guess here in Europe and probably other countries too, but um, that they, they say, um, when I'm finished my a competition career then I'll do horsemanship or and and I and I would say boy that's that's unfortunate that's really too bad because good horsemanship will make you better at the competitions um, so I compete in all kinds of different events uh, over the years and still do and at world you know compete against guys that are considered to be the best in the world so I've been I'll compete on behalf of Canada and the only reason that I can compete is because of how much horsemanship that I've learned and, and I'll often compete um, without a bit so I will ride with a, uh, a rope hackamore or something I can use a bit but I kind of want to prove to to everybody it's not what you stick in a horse's mouth it's what you stick in his mind that makes the difference to what kind of success you have. So I've competed in competitions and won them and never been in them before. And I rode, I was the only person in them that rode with the rope hackamore. And so that's not a brag. I'm not trying, I don't mean to sound braggy, but um, what, what I'm trying to get across is that it, it's, if you're not working on your horsemanship, it's really unfortunate because the amount that we're, you would be missing with horses is be incredible. Like if we're, if it's, it's not a separate thing that you, you don't do horsemanship over here and then compete over there. It's all one thing. It's all one, one deal. You're doing horsemanship to one level or one degree or another, you know, and I want to do horsemanship to as high as I possibly can because I know it's going to be funner, safer. I'm going to compete at a higher level. Everything's going to be better if I get my horsemanship up there. So they're not separate things. You can't just do um horsemanship during the week and compete on the weekends you carry it together it's a it's all part of the same deal